All right, I think uh, we're about ready to get started. So welcome everyone to the afternoon keynote. Uh, my name is James McGregor. I'm a uh, <laughs> publishing associate director of publishing uh, strategic <laughs> projects and services. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long, long few days. Some of us have been doing this since uh, Monday. Uh, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Tara Robertson to you, to, uh, to you today. Tara, an intersectional feminist who uses data and research to advocate for equality and inclusion, is the diversity and inclusion lead at Mozilla. Her core values are social justice, collaboration, and all things open source, open access, and open education. As a librarian with five years leading accessibility work in higher education, she brings practical expertise of how universal design can be used to include people with disabilities and enhance, and enhance access for everyone. So that's the bio. I've got to say, I, I can't express how excited I was to see Tara's name, Tara's name, sorry. Fuck. Sorry, I, I also sweared first, so <laughs> that's done. <laughs> there, the swearing is allowed. I can't express how excited I was to see Tara's name on the list of keynotes uh, for this conference when we were preparing it <clears throat> earlier. What she, what she will be talking about today, uh, specifically diversity, inclusion, and accessibility, are the most timely and urgent issues that we deal with today, I believe, for us as PKP, as a software developer, um, and as the, just this uh, social group that we have here. PKP has made some incredible strides, I think, over the past year or so uh, in our approach to these topics. For example, we've created an accessibility team, uh, and we've included developments towards accessibility uh, as, the, as, as part of the forefront of our development effort. Uh, and that's, that's no, <laughs> that, that takes time, and that takes money, but, but we've committed to that. Uh, just the same, uh, I do believe that there are many other things that we can start to do uh, uh, at, at, at the governing level uh, and at the community level as well to promote these, these crucial, crucial issues today. Um, I am thankful for the leadership and guidance provided to our community uh, by members like Tara. And in a spirit of openness, urgency, and solidarity, please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming her today. Um, while you're introducing me, I dropped the clicker on the ground and the bat came off and it fell under and a battery came out and I was like, oh great, this is actually my worst nightmare. And there goes my phone. <laughs> but you didn't swear. Fuck. Um, I'm so excited to be here. When I saw Kevin Stranick's name in my inbox, I was like, gosh, I wonder why he's emailing me. And, it's such a delight to get to come to Barcelona. Um, I've never been to Spain, I've never been to Barcelona. It's been a really amazing opportunity. I heard some really great talks this morning about interrogating our language and being inclusive there, as well as accessibility. So really heartened to hear that those conversations are happening here. So, oh, did I break it when I dropped it? Where do I point it? Shazam! Is there another Can we get a hand for the awesome AV support? Woo! Oh, there we go, it works. Yes, okay. So I was born in Vancouver, Canada, um, and I grew up in a logging town called Prince George, which is halfway to Alaska. Who's cheering? <laughs> um, it was a 17-hour trip to get here from Vancouver. And then this morning, when I left my hotel in Barcelona, I took the metro, and I saw someone holding a PKP folder. And that was Lady from Biteca. And I was like, excuse me, are you going to PKP? So I followed her on the train, and then on the bus, and then came here. It's been worth the trip. So growing up, in Prince George, we measured the size of towns by the number of McDonald's restaurants there were. Um, Prince George, population 75,000, had four McDonald's. It was the biggest town, 10 hours drive in any direction. Um, this is Mr. PG, he's the town mascot. 
Originally, he was made of wood, but he rotted, and he was rebuilt with sheet metal and fiberglass and made to last. My mom is Japanese-Canadian, and my dad is Scottish, of Scottish and Irish ancestry. He's white. So growing up as a mixed-race kid in Prince George, I was kind of different. Um, I'm also queer, so I've had a lot of experience in my life feeling like I don't fit. Now that I'm an adult, I realize the superpower that it gives me is I can look into the majority group and see things that many people might not. Also, kind of in my search for home, I've lived in seven different countries, including Scotland and Japan. And they were really great experiences to live and understand other cultures, but my home is in Vancouver. Before Mozilla, I was a librarian for 12 years, and the last five years I ran an accessibility organization, which I'm gonna talk about a little later. Um, people ask about my strange career path from libraries to doing diversity and inclusion in tech. And it's not that strange for me, um, so I'll just connect the dots. Um, in libraries, I worked in library technology, and within our conferences and technology communities, I helped work to make our, con our keynote conference, our conference keynotes more diverse, and worked with the community to put codes of conduct in place so we could be explicit about what our, what our norms were together. So two years ago, I joined Mozilla's diversity and inclusion team. That's right, I work in HR now. And it's kind of fascinating working with people for that to be my full-time job. Um, I'm sort of the data nerd on our team. I look at HR information system metrics to, to better understand who works at Mozilla, as well as who we're hiring and who's choosing to leave as well as looking at our employee engagement survey, both the qualitative and quantitative data there. So it's very much a data-driven um, process. Um, I've also worked on projects on trans inclusion and accessibility. So this quote from Toni Morrison, um, she writes, all paradises, all utopias are designed by who is not there, by the people who are not allowed in. And I think for those of us who work in scholarly publishing, in libraries, in academia, we like to think of our work in a really positive way. And I think our work does make a big impact on the world. But it's also important to forget that the worlds that we're building and the, the things that we're building that we see as positive are leaving people out. So Robin DeRosa, an academic who I admire a lot, used this in her digital pedagogy lab presentation. So for me, for the last 10, 15 years, these two questions have been the fundamental ones. So in most social situations, I think it's interesting to observe who's in the room, who sits at the table, who speaks a lot, who has social capital, who feels welcome, and whose ideas are respected and centered by default. I think it's even more important to note who's missing, who doesn't, who's sitting on the margins, who doesn't feel welcome, and who has to fight to have their viewpoints heard by others. So I'll invite you to look around right now quietly and ponder these questions for yourself. So I think we all know what it, likes, what, what it feels like to belong, and we know what it feels like to not belong. So I just want to kind of sink into that for the next couple of minutes through a short exercise. It's gonna be a think, pair, share. So first, I'm gonna ask you to think on your own for one minute, and I'm gonna time you, um, about a time where someone did something to make you feel welcome. It could be at your workplace, on a sports team, in your neighborhood or church, anything where you were new and someone did something to make you feel welcome. What was that? So either write this down in your head, on your computer, on a laptop, you've got one minute.
10 seconds left. Awesome. Now I want you to get into groups of two. It could be someone beside you or behind you. If you're a person of one, join and make a group of three. You've got two minutes to share those things with your neighbor. Go. I'm going to go down with Jason. Okay. What do you want me to do with you? No. No, okay. <laughs> Okay, so next, I want you to get into a group of four or five, however that works, and the question's going to change a little bit. What's something that we can do to make the PKP community even more inclusive? So in your group of four or five, please discuss this and then add your best ideas to this document. It's bit.ly slash pkp hyphen inclusion. Got it? So there's three parts. Group of four, discuss this question, add your ideas. You've got four minutes, go. Do you want me to do this too? Or do you have to do this? I think you have to take photos or something, don't you? I wasn't sure if people were going to participate, and I'm delighted that they did. Yeah, I think everybody's really keen on like using their brains right now. Yeah. I will let Jason take the photos. Though. Is the clicker working now? Yep. Ooh, I didn't do anything. So, um, Kevin cheered about PG because he's moved there. Right? I didn't know that. He is now living in Prince George. Why would anyone do that? Uh, he likes snowshoeing. Uh, wow. Yeah, no, they. Um, My parents I, live there. He can fill you in. Wow. Um, but they. Uh, um, I think it was the right time to sell in Vancouver. In, uh, and you could Florida. buy a house outright. Pretty much, yeah. Um, he likes sort of an outdoor lifestyle.
Do something like, I know they've got like, like a group of groups that are local to parts of the world. Yep. I mean, because we have like these sprints every couple of months, yeah. a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So we keep these small sprints, like, every week. That's like the semi secret plan of the next one. Like, we, we ought to be having like another conference like this, or probably pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, but having regional. Sorry? More satellite meetings in local languages. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, like that kind of stuff. Like, just, um, and uh, like it doesn't have to be run by us, right? Like, no. Like we have people who know all this stuff as well or better than we do. So. so you've got 30 seconds left. There's some great ideas going up. Wow. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I was really worried that I was gonna throw this out and everyone was just gonna look at me. So thank you so much for participating. I'm gonna just leave the dock up for a second before I go back to the slides. Um, but there's some great ideas in here. So um, figure out which ones that you can help move forward or figure out which ones as a, as a community you wanna prioritize. So who here is familiar with Mozilla? Yay! Um, I work at Mozilla and we're a company that has about 1,100 staff worldwide. There's two people here in Barcelona um, and there's about 10,000 community volunteers. Our mission, we're a mission-driven company and our mission is to ensure that the internet is open and accessible to all. And the way that we do this is through products. So some people might be familiar with the web browser Firefox, and we have a whole suite of Firefox products now. We have Lockwise, which is a password manager, Monitor, which will tell you about data breaches, and Send, which is an encrypted way to send files up to one gigabyte. That's the end of my commercial. <laughs> um, we have one shareholder. And that's our nonprofit foundation. So it's kind of a, it's a unique structure in the tech business. Um, the foundation does really awesome work on policy. Um, they fund the Mozilla Fellows. Uh, there's a bunch of them doing open science work. And they publish the Internet Health Report, which is a really excellent and accessible document around Internet health. Um, so, diversity, what is diversity? Um, at Mozilla, the, this word cloud is from the original focus groups we did with Mozillians, those are people in the Mozilla community, about diversity. So when I say diversity, I'm talking about different facets of someone's identity or demographic that could be represented. So like gender, sex, religion, race, age. Um, something that's unique to Mozilla, in the top right, you'll see MoFo and MoCo. So people who work at the corporation work for MoCo, and the people at the foundation are called MoFos. <laughs> so these are just different kind of facets of who we are as people. Inclusion. 
Inclusion is more like the feeling, like do people feel like they belong at work? If they speak up, will their voice be heard? Um, and if they disagree, like can they speak up? So while diversity is more about the demographics of the organization, inclusion is about the feeling and um, if people feel included and those types of things. So there's a ton of social science research um, connecting diversity and diverse organizations to innovative organizations and innovation. Um, my favorite article is by Dr. Catherine Phillips. Um, she's a professor at Columbia Business School. And she wrote a really accessible summary of the academic literature in Scientific American in an article called How Diversity Makes Us Smarter. And she summarizes that diverse groups tend to outperform homogeneous ones. And when we're around people who look different than us or have different like political opinions or how, like come from a different discipline, we work harder to make our arguments. We don't assume that the person sitting across from us has the same background and way of thinking of things. So we actually work harder to express ourselves. And when we hear dissent, we think more carefully and more rigorously to respond to that. Um, Yeah, and I, I, there's a couple other points that she, she summarizes from the research, and that's diverse groups also tend to have more conflict. And conflict's not necessarily a bad thing if it's done respectfully, but it, it's something for us to consider. My background is in libraries, and in libraries we generally as a culture aren't very comfortable with conflict. So as we want to become more diverse as communities or as institutions, we also need to give people the tools to engage in conflict productively and respectfully. So Mozilla's mission is to keep the internet open and accessible for all. And if we don't have everyone at the table helping us build these products, there's no way we're gonna achieve that. And you know, it's the right thing to do. So this fall, we won an uh, Innovative Workplace Award. Um, this is Selena Duckelman. She's a senior director in the Firefox organization. Um, it was cool to be recognized this way by Fast Company. And they called out the six million that we've donated to universities to fund innovation there, um, as well as um, our Open Innovations um, Common Voice project, which is kind of crowdsourcing the corpus of data to be able for anyone to make voice assistant products, not just like the big tech companies. So like diversity is not all just sunshine, rainbows, innovation, and la la la. That piece about conflict, um, we've got our community participation guidelines, which is our code of conduct, to kind of outline the behaviors that we tolerate and the behaviors that we don't in our workplace. So it's our agreements on how we want to work together. So this quote is from Mitchell Baker, our chairwoman. She says, Mozilla's mission is to build the internet as a global public resource, open and accessible to all. Open and accessible to all implies a deep commitment to inclusion and to building inclusive practices. As part of this commitment, we describe a set of behaviors of inclusion that we aspire to. These are set out in our community participation guidelines. So it's linked directly to our mission, these like inclusive behaviors. So our community participation guidelines, or our CPG, is open licensed and available on the web. I also recommend reading it because it's written in plain English and it has lots of concrete examples in it. I think when we're working, we have staff in I think 18 different countries. We have to be really clear what we mean when we say we want to be inclusive and respectful because that could differ from place to place and from person to person. So as an example, um, one of the required behaviors is to be direct but professional. And the CPG says, we're likely to have some discussions about when criticism respect, is respectful and when it's not. We must be able to speak directly when we disagree and when we think we need to improve. 
We cannot withhold hard truths. Doing so respectfully is hard. Doing so when others don't seem to be listening is harder. And hearing such comments when one is the recipient can be even harder still. We need to be honest and direct as well as respectful. So for me, this is aspirational as well. Um, I go back and I read our, our community participation guidelines probably once a month. And I realized I was re being reluctant and having a conversation I needed to have with a teammate. And it was uncomfortable for me. I'm, I don't like conflict. But reading this, I was like, oh yeah, this is what I signed up for. And it's difficult, but that's the work. So rereading the CPG on my own was kind of the nudge that I needed to have that conversation with my teammate about something that I didn't agree with him about. And it was good that we had it. And I should have had it much earlier. Um, it went really fine. So our, our CPG also outlines behaviors we don't tolerate, which include like obvious things like violence, threats of violence, harassment. Um, but it also talks about some stuff like we need to get consent before we touch someone's body. Um, and calls out pregnant women's stomachs, people's tattoos, hair, mobility aids, like a cane or a wheelchair. And I think by being really concrete and specific, it helped me really kind of wrap my head around like what that looks like. Some of these things were, I was, for me, were common sense, but I'd never thought about t touching a pregnant, woman, pregnant woman's belly. Like, I don't think I would, but I'd never really thought about it. And because so much of our work takes place on, in an online environment, there's also the example of using the kiss emoji. Like, don't use that unless someone has given you permission or you've asked and they're like, yeah, give me a kiss emoji. Because otherwise it's weird and gross. So I think by having our CPG being in plain English and have so, having so many specific examples, it gives us a really good foundation about the way we want to be with each other. So the diversity part of the diversity and inclusion part of my job is looking at the demographics of the company. And I think tech has rightfully got a, a bad rep in the media for not having a lot of women, especially women in technical roles, as well as like other, other dimensions of diversity that tech isn't doing great in. Um, so we've been examining our hiring process and looking at like the unconscious bias that we have and where it could be entering different parts of the decision-making process. And it's interesting, the research on this goes back to um, symphony orchestras. So in the 1970s, top orchestras in the US were only 5% women. And at the time, there were a lot of reasons given for that. Um, some people said women were smaller than men, so had smaller techniques. Women were more temperamental and likely to demand special attention or treatment. Uh, and one person just said, the more women, the poorer the sound. One orchestra conductor just said, I don't think women should even be in an orchestra. So it's like, oh, okay. Um, so by 2000, orchestras in the US were almost 30% women. What happened? Orchestras started using blind auditions. So people who were auditioning for the orchestra would play behind a curtain so the panel couldn't see them. They were only judging the players on the sound of the music that they were playing, which is the key criteria for being an orchestra musician. So at first, with the curtain, they could still distinguish between men and women because of women's high heel shoes on the stage. So they either got women to take their high heels off or put a carpet down. So even, I like that because the, they, they had a good intent in debiasing that process and then realized that they still needed to go one more step. So now most orchestras in the US are 40 to 50% women. 
the places where women lag behind are um, in conductors and in the brass section. And they call this the brass ceiling. So at Mozilla, our version of this kind of blind audition or evaluation based on the key criteria, we use a tool called HackerRank, which has a bit of an unfortunate name, but we're evaluating people on the code that they're writing and basing that on the, the job that they would do. So we're not looking at the university that someone went to or if they have a PhD or not, unless that's necessary. Instead, we're thinking about the key criteria for the job, figuring out an assessment process for that, and then picking the best people. So it's with our university internship program that we've kind of done a lot of this experimentation. And over time, we saw a huge increase in diversity. Uh, women went up from 6% to 43%. People of color went from 42 to 55%. But the biggest area of increase was the educational institutions represented. So for people who work in educational institutions, we, we have an idea of kind of like what the top tier universities are. Um, and I'm sure you can name them for like engineering and computer science. And just because you went to MIT or Stanford, doesn't necessarily mean you're the smartest person or the best person for a specific job. Um, so this was really interesting. We also saw that there was an increase from seven to 41 institutions, and that also included a code academy, which was cool. So it kind of, doing these experiments helped us kind of question the assumptions that we were making about who the best candidates were. So I think this is also relevant to open journal systems. Um, in an article in Wired titled, Diversity in Open Source is Even Worse Than Tech Overall, by Clint Finley, he says, the open source development community remains startlingly white and male, even by the tech industry's dismal standards. So um, at Mozilla, we removed meritocracy from our leadership and government governance documents about two years ago. Um, there's, when I started getting involved in open source, I loved sort of the myth of meritocracy that I could get involved and it would just be my contrib contributions and that they would be evaluated on that and that's kind of like the best bits would rise to the top. And we have to kind of question who's got the time to volunteer on projects if you're not paid to be a developer on a open source project or who has the equipment or the childcare. So I think it's, if meritocracy is a key idea for PKP, I'm not sure if it is, it may be worth kind of interrogating the assumptions behind that. So um, I had a lot of imposter syndrome when I applied for this job at Mozilla. I wasn't really looking for a job. I was pretty content doing what I was doing. And Mozilla was a company that I've admired for a long time. So when I applied, I just thought, like, who do I think I am? Like, there's just no way. And even at the, the application stage, there were a couple things in the job posting that kind of nudged me off the fence and towards applying. And the job ad said, you demonstrate a history of working in a, collabor in a collaborative and open manner, whether that be in an open source project or simply openly discussing projects and questions in your office. Hmm. I was like, I was intrigued, and I was like, I think, I think they're like poking at this open source thing and digging, digging underneath. And it said you should apply even though, even if you don't feel like your credentials are a hundred percent match for the position itself. And I was used to library jobs where there could be twenty-seven bullet points, and you need to hit all of those, and like that's that's really a lot. And the job said, we're looking for relevant skills and experience, not a checklist that exactly matches the position itself. So I was like, hmm. Like, if I can map the work that I've done to what they're looking for, they're open to people like me applying. And of course, all of this was by design. It was all deliberate. Knowing that open source scales white and male, requiring explicit open source experience would limit the candidate pool. And people would self-select out. 
I might have self-selected out. The key experience, the key criteria is the open collaboration, not the open source experience itself. So we also use a tool called Textio to make sure that our job postings use balanced language. So we don't post job ads for rock stars or ninjas anymore. So how diverse is the PKP community? Who is missing and who doesn't feel included? I want to change um, topics a little bit here and talk about accessibility. So my last librarian job was at Caper BC, which is an organization that pr format shifts print textbooks into digital formats for students with print disabilities. So a print disability could be any kind of disability that makes using print not feasible. So a student who is blind or visually impaired, a student with a learning disability, a student with a physical disability who can't hold a book or chronic pain and can't schlep their books around, all of those could be print disabilities. So I was thinking about OJS's publishing workflow and the dissemination of information and in some ways, the Caper BC workflows were opposite. Um, we were literally chopping spines off of books, scanning them, and putting them into an electronic format that would work with students' assistive technology. And while our focus was textbooks, we all know it's not possible to study at a university or to do any kind of scholarly research without access to journal articles. We also remediated those and it was particularly frustrating to take inaccessible digital journal articles and have to remediate them to be accessible digital journal articles. Um, we would OCR them, add headings so students using screen readers could, could navigate throughout them, as well as adding um, alt text for charts, graphs, and images. And like, it's a digital thing. It could have been accessible from the start. And kind of the tax on students with print disabilities is that they need to wait. So their progress is slower and they're not able to progress as quickly as students without print disabilities. So in the built environment, uh, we've got these things called curb cuts or dropped curbs, apparently, in the UK. Um, which makes it easier for people who are using wheelchairs to navigate off of the sidewalk, off of the curb, and across the street. It also makes it easier for people who are pushing bicycles, pe parents with a baby carriage, or a delivery person pushing a heavy load on a cart to be able to get off the sidewalk and cross the street. So we can think about curb cuts in the digital environment as well. I'm just looking at the time and I've got three minutes. So um, check out the accessibility toolkit, it's great. Um, one of the advantages about working in the open is that it was translated into French and a second edition was published by someone who's now doing a master's of design in inclusive design. So yesterday was the Transgender Day of Remembrance or TDOR. It's an event to remember and honor the lives of trans and gender diverse people who've been murdered. It's also called the Transgender Day of Resilience to honor the resilience of these communities. I want a world where trans and non-binary people aren't just surviving, but where they can thrive. So some of the work that I've done at Mozilla was to write guidelines to make documentation on where you would need to update your name and gender marker if you transitioned your gender at Mozilla. Um, and it, the work has been successful and leading and there was an article in Forbes about it and my mom was like, you mean like there's another Forbes? Like not the business one? And I was like, no mom, the real like Forbes magazine. She's like, huh, how about that? It's like, thanks mom. Um, so because we're a distributed company, 50% of our staff work remote. Uh, we come together twice a year for all hands. And last summer was in San Francisco. So imagine 1,200 of us in a giant hotel ballroom. And 
it was the first day of our plenaries and we had each of our executives doing present, short presentations about kind of the highlights and what was coming next. And in between each of those was uh, an individual contributor, either sharing a user story, um, reading some feedback from one of our end users, or something else. And this is Lauren, and she spoke between our chief marketing officer and our chief people officer. Hi, my name is Lauren Nylett. I work on lifecycle marketing out of my home in North Carolina. I recently sent a letter it gets to louder. we just met, and uh, I'm going to share it with all of you now. Yasha, you might recall a conversation we briefly had at Austin All Hands about some, some interesting <clears throat> changes in my life. But just to put a label on it, I'm transitioning my gender presentation to female. This has been a lifelong time coming. <laughs> This has been a lifelong time coming. While I wouldn't say changing genders is anything close to the easiest thing I've ever done, this ongoing process has already been one of the best. I've been asking colleagues, one or two at a time, to start calling me Lauren and referring to me with feminine pronouns. And I'd like for you to do the same. Don't worry about slip-ups. I forget at least once a day, and it's my name. <laughs> <clears throat> like any self-respecting marketer, I'm working with HR on a go-to-market strategy to take this news big. <laughs> that is, uh, by the way, highfalutin talk for an email to all of marketing. <laughs> but I'm writing to give you an early heads up. I do want to mention that your personal and professional commitment to making Mozilla Marketing a safe space that values all people was a huge factor in my decision to begin transition. As a member of the group that worked on team norms, I'm very aware that things here weren't perfect. But I also know that after I began living authentically, I would feel respected and protected at Mozilla. And the work I do would be more important than my pronouns. You should know how much of an incredible impact your commitment to these values can have on one individual life. Thank you just doesn't seem to capture it. Thank you. So the feeling in the room was amazing. I think when we all realized what was going on on stage, everyone leaned forward. And I think it takes so much courage to say that in front of your company. And also to speak in front of 1,200 people is super nerve wracking. The feeling in the room was really magical. I wish I could like spray something so you could feel that. So I know I'm over time. So I just want to go back to these, the two questions that I introduced at the beginning. When you're back at your work next week doing whatever thing you do in whatever workplace you work in, I'd encourage you to think about these two questions. Like, whose voices are missing here? And how do we include these voices? Um, have a great rest of the conference. Thanks. <laughs>